Sonic, the heart of your system. Alright guys, Dominic here for Kick Guru, and today we are reviewing AMD's new RX 5500 XT. More specifically, we are actually reviewing two 5500 XTs as we have both a 4 and an 8GB model. So for the 4GB model, we have Sapphire's RX 5500 XT Pulse, and then for our 8GB card, we are looking at the ASRock Challenger. Just before we get into gaming performance, which is really where I want to focus the start of this review, it is worth just quickly recapping the core spec of the 5500 XT. So at the high level, we have 22 CUs, 1408 stream processors, and 32 ROPs. Just to clear up any confusion, this is identical to the core spec of the RX 5500. They both share the same Navi 14 GPU. But the main difference really is that the 5500 XT is for DIY enthusiasts, so people who are going to buy this card standalone and install it in your own PC. The 5500 should also have slightly lower boost clocks, it's only available in 4GB capacity, and then primarily it's only available to OEM. So if you want to go out and buy a 5500 card, it will be the 5500 XT, unless you are buying a full system. As for pricing, this was confirmed to us earlier today, this morning in fact. So for the 4GB 5500 XT, that is going to come in at 159 British pounds and then the 8 gigabyte model is 20 pounds more expensive so 179.99 that really is going to do it for our preamble though because I really want to get straight into the gaming performance looking at both of these cards at 1080p so we are basically putting the 4 gigabyte and the 8 gigabyte models head to head if you are interested in our 1440p charts though you can find those over on kickguru.net along with our full testing methodology Anyway, if we get the charts up now and get right into it, I think the first thing to do is really just confirm that pretty much as I guess we kind of expected, overall performance for the 5500 XT at 1080p resolution is pretty much on par with Nvidia's own 1650 Super, which launched last month. As is usually the case when directly comparing one card from AMD against one card from Nvidia, there is a bit of performance variation, so we see some wins for Nvidia in certain titles, and then some wins for AMD in other titles. That said, there's really nothing that substantial in terms of the overall differences, and in fact only 2 of the 10 games we tested showed more than a 5% difference either way, so you really can expect very similar performance between the cards when gaming at 1080p resolution. To demonstrate that, the Sapphire 4GB 5500 XT is just 1% slower on average compared to our Asus Strix 1650 Super, while the 8GB ASRock Challenger is actually 1% faster on average, so this is very similar overall performance. On that note, it is worth saying the Strix is a heavily overclocked 1650 Super, so we might see a slight difference if we were comparing to a reference clock card, but I really wouldn't expect it to be that substantial. The difference between both the 4GB and the 8GB VRAM models is also going to be something worth discussing. Based on our testing here, for most games I don't think it really makes much difference as we effectively saw identical performance between the two models. Though that being said, we did actually see three of our titles and they were Far Cry New Dawn, Middle Earth Shadow of War and then also Shadow of the Tomb Raider. In those three games we did see a bit more of a difference with the 4GB card coming in between 5 and 7% slower on average at 1080p. For me, that does mean you could easily argue that the 8GB model is going to prove its worth in the years to come as more and more AAA titles are going to be eating up more of that frame buffer even at 1080p resolution. But then again, you could also make the argument that as of now, it's not really a huge factor. So it kind of depends. Do you want to spend a little less now and get performance which is going to be good for today? Or do you want to spend a little bit more and potentially have slightly better future proofing for your gaming in the years to come? Just to round out this performance testing section as well, we are just going to compare these 5500 XTs to a couple other competitors that are kind of around this price 
uh, from both AMD and Nvidia. So if we start with the RX 580, which is now I think effectively going to be discontinued, we can see that the 4 GB 5500 XT is on average 4% faster at 1080p, while the 8 GB model is on average 6% faster at 1080p. Both of these 5500 XT models though are slower than RX 590, so the 4 GB model came in on average 7% slower, while the 8 GB model is on average 5% slower. Finally, for one comparison against Team Green, we can see that the 4 GB 5500 XT is on average 11% slower than GT. GTX 1660 at 1080p, and that is the original 1660, not the more recent SuperCard. And then compared to the 8GB 5500 XT, we can see that the AMD card is on average 8% slower at 1080p than the 1660. So that is really it for our look at the gaming performance of these cards. If you stick around to the end of the video, I will kind of wrap up all my thoughts on the overall performance and the price to performance, so do stick around for that. But now we're going to look closer at the cards we have here to give you a look at the designs and also the coolers. So if we start with a look at the Sapphire Pulse card, the first thing I noticed really was that Sapphire has kind of stripped back a few of the, the kind of color design. So the 5700 Pulse we reviewed had a lot more red and silver accents where the 5500 XD Pulse is a lot more just plain black. So personally, I do quite like that approach. It's just quite a stealthy overall look, apart from one or two red accents. We can also see that is a standard dual slot thickness, and it's also a dual fan card. So both of those fans are actually relatively large, coming in at 100 millimeters. Another positive point for the Pulse is also the full length backplate. And yeah, it's actually made of metal, which is a definite plus point. And again, it is mostly black with just a few gray lines here and there. And we can also see the Pulse logo. Another good addition at this price point is actually a dual BIOS switch. So that is positioned just towards the front of the card next to the IO bracket. And by default, it does ship with the performance BIOS engaged. And other things though also include the eight pin power connector, which is standard for a 5500 XT. Now, as for the cooler, we can firstly see it uses a single fin stack and there are also three plated heat pipes. The GPU itself contacts with a little copper core while there is a separate base plate around that for the VRAM chips. And just off to the side, we can see another plate for the VRM. Moving on to the PCB, we can see this is actually very short. So a fair bit of the length of the card itself is actually taken up just by the heatsink as that does overhang the PCB. But we can see that there is a six phase VRM for the GPU and a single phase VRM for the memory. That memory is of course 4 gigabytes of GDDR6 clocked at 14 gigabits per second and here the modules are supplied by Micron. Lastly we can also get a look at that very very small Navi 14 GPU sitting in the middle of the PCB measuring in at just 158 square millimeters. As for the ASRock Challenger card now it is again a relatively plain looking card though it does have a bit more of a color theme with slightly more prominent yellow and gray accents on the front. Being completely honest, I don't think it's the best looking card in the world, but at this price point, I don't think it matters that much. Additionally, we can also get a look at those two fans, which are slightly smaller than the Sapphire, with each measuring 90 millimeters across. Flipping the card over, we can also see there is, again, another metal backplate, which is a good inclusion. But unlike the Pulse, this one only covers the length of the PCB, so you can see a bit of the heatsink overhanging the PCB itself. Other things to note include the fact that there is no onboard dual BIOS for the Challenger card, and power requirements are again a single 8-pin PCI power connector. Opening up the card to look at the cooler, we can see a number of similarities with the Sapphire Pulse, primarily that both cards have three copper heat pipes, and that both also have a central copper contact area for the GPU die. Additionally, for the Challenger, we can see there is a separate coal plate for the VRAM chips, and another for the VRM. Lastly, we can also get a look at the PCB for the Challenger. So this is again very short and looks almost identical to that of the Pulse. So I would be 99% certain that both companies are just using AMD's reference board. The primary difference for the ASRock card though, and this is actually something quite interesting, something I've not seen before, is that you'll probably notice there's only four memory modules, but this is meant to be an eight gigabyte card. So clearly what is going on here is that we are now starting to see double density memory modules. So essentially each chip is now gonna be a two gigabyte G6 memory module. 
I've not seen this before on any other consumer card with G6. Um, I don't know if others are actually exist. If they have, I've certainly not heard of them, but it's just something to point out, which is, I think, quite interesting for the Challenger 5500 XT. So that was really our quick look at the cards themselves and how the coolers are designed. We're now going to move on to talk about our temperature testing. So both cards here actually did really well, probably a little bit better than I was expecting considering that they're not the most flashy cards out there. So for the ASRock Challenger here, the edge temperature peaked at just 64 degrees and the Sapphire Pulse was only one degree hotter. Also, if we look at the junction temperature for these 5500 XT cards, both were under 90 degrees and memory temperature of 70 degrees for the Challenger and 72 degrees for the Pulse are again nothing to worry about. In terms of noise levels, here we did see the Sapphire Pulse do a little bit better than the Challenger with total noise levels peaking at just around 38 decibels for the Sapphire Pulse. So that is a very, very good result and made it almost inaudible so I had to get my ear quite close to the card to actually hear the fan spin. The Challenger certainly isn't loud with noise peaking around 42 decibels but it is slightly more audible but still overall a very respectable result. The last performance metric to look at for these two cards is power consumption. This is quite an interesting area as total system power draw for both of these cards was around 200 watts with the Challenger pulling about 10 watts more than the Pulse. That does mean that compared to RX 580, we are seeing significant efficiency improvements as the 5500 XT is not only faster than 580, but it's now pulling around 70 watts less in terms of total system power draw. That said, NVIDIA's 1650 Super does still have the edge here and by a relative margin with total system power draw with that NVIDIA card, being around 50 watts less than these 5500 XTs. Just before wrapping up this video now, the last thing I want to touch on is manual overclocking. Sadly, I had no luck here. I was pushed very tight for time and I found some quite erratic behavior when trying to manually overclock, which I guess at this point I'm gonna to have to put down to a driver issue, but more testing is needed on this. In a nutshell, what I found was I could occasionally get improved performance by tweaking the GPU clock and also the memory clock, but then strangely, without me actually changing anything, the next time I tested the same, let's say it was a 3D Mark benchmark, my performance would actually decrease. So I have no idea why this was happening and it's gonna be something we're gonna to have to look at, I think maybe give it a few weeks to see if a software driver update can help fix this. But for manual overclocking, this is something we're gonna to have to circle back to. Anyway, it is now time to wrap up this review. Overall, I do have to say that I think the 5500 XT is a very solid GPU launch from AMD, and in terms of its performance, it is definitely very competitive with NVIDIA's 1650 Super. That really is the primary battle for the 5500 XT, as like we mentioned at the start of this video, the 4GB model is slotting in at £160, and the 8GB model is slotting in at £180. This means that the 4GB card is only £10 more expensive than the GTX 1650 Super, where cards start at around £150. Considering that performance is basically completely matched, it's like a dead heat between the two, it really does become a bit of a toss up between which one you should buy. On the one hand, you could make the argument for the 1650 Super as it is still more power efficient and we also had better luck overclocking that GPU. But then for the 5500 XT, it does have a number of good software features we like, such as Radeon image sharpening and there's also the new AMD boost feature. While 5500 XT is also coming with a new game bundle where you can get Monster Hunter World and I think it also comes with three months of Xbox Game Pass. But then I never like to put too much focus on those as they're obviously not gonna run forever. I would say though, in regards to the eight gigabyte model that at 180 pounds, I do think that card is a little bit harder to justify, especially with prices of the GTX 1660 now dropping to around that level. I was looking online earlier today and I actually saw a 1660 priced at 189 pounds. So that is a faster GPU for not a whole lot of extra money. You could of course make the argument about the extra VRAM and future proofing. All I can really say is based on our testing today, Moving up to eight gigs for the 5500 XT doesn't really make a huge difference, but obviously it's quite hard to say how that's gonna change in the next year or two. 
So I do think that pretty much sums it up quite well. Overall, the 5500 XT is a very solid 1080p gaming GPU. I do think the card could have done with coming in about £10 cheaper just to give it a little bit more of an edge over the 1650 Super. But as things stand, they're both very close in terms of pricing and very close in terms of overall performance. So it is a bit of a toss up as to which one you should go for. My personal advice would be maybe have a look at the games you play and see which card does better in certain titles. For instance, we saw 5500 XT doing a little bit better in Gears 5, but then maybe if you play Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you might want to go for the 1650 Super. So it really does come down to fine margins like that. But either way, you are going to get very solid performance at 1080p. That is pretty much going to do it for this review now guys if you liked it you can give us a thumbs up also leave me a comment down below let me know what you think of the new 5500 xt and will you be buying one you can also hit subscribe if you haven't already poke that notification bell just so you won't miss any of our future videos i would also love to check with you guys over on discord so you can find the link to our channel in the description lastly it would be awesome if some of you guys would consider backing us on patreon not only do you get access to some of our videos early we also try and run some patreon exclusive of competitions so you can check out a link to that in the description below until then though guys i'm dominic forkit guru and i'll see you in the next video